Welcome back. Today we are going into 1950s culture. Um, we're really going to get a, a glimpse of what the culture is like, not just the political realm. So it's kind of uh, going to be a little bit of a hopefully more cultural immersion of the 1950s as well. So it's going to be a little bit longer, but there's a lot of good content in here. Um, one thing you may want to, to think about as little refreshers, perhaps um, the video a date with your family, which um, I, I suggested in the last video, and it's it's really, really great um, depiction of, of what 1950s um, American families were supposed to be or how they were portrayed in media. But the big question we can really start to think about is, was this true? Is this real? Um, it was a little bit awkward and, and clunky and and that there's sister and brother and boy and girl like they they don't give them names and it's that cheesy overtone type of voice and that all the women um both the mother and the daughter are helping with the cooking and the preparation of the food and and the boys are just studying and playing and cleaning up and father comes home from work and everyone's tailoring to his needs and it's it's very interesting we'll say um but understanding that we're going to talk about family depictions and social norms and and, and social depictions and expectations in society as well now on to our main objectives um objective a really focusing on the context for social change we're still working on that story um so not so much that it just comes off of 1945 obviously the decades come off of one another so not just the 50s come off of the 40s but why is it that it's after World War II and why does that make a difference? Why is that relevant to our discussion? How does that add to really the story that's going on? Um, continuities and changes in the Cold War policies, we'll get to that at the very, very end. Um, the Red Scare is, is kind, of, kind of the impacts of that. We can still look at that story a little bit from, from uh, that happened at the beginning of the 1950s. Um, economic growth in the years after World War II, huge. That's basically all engulfed into this. Um, and then there's different migrant groups that um, inside the United States. And so migration can be um, immigrants from another country or it could be internal migration as well, which is also very, very important. Um, so where are people moving and why are they moving? What types of people are moving? The other thing we can think about is how mass culture is going to uh, play into this. So what is mass culture at this time? And then how does it impact society? So um, Change in society doesn't always mean progress. It doesn't mean positive. It could be negative change as well, or kind of uh, turning back of the clock, and we may see that here as well. Um, military diplomatic responses, we'll hit that at the end um, over time, and then really developing, changing kind of where America is and, and what our role should be and what, what are Americans really encouraging in terms of foreign policy. And then lastly, really the extent to which how much America's national identity changed. So we're going to be going through a lot of formation and changes from decade to decade and moment to moment. And so we'll really see that in the 1950s. So to sum up all of those objectives, really the core root of everything you really want to understand today is to look at um, American foreign and domestic policy in the 1950s. How is it different? How does it change? What is it? That's really the essence of what we're looking at. And I'm going to provide you so many different examples of that. Hopefully get a little bit of cultural immersion back into the 1950s and we'll see where it takes us. One thing to really ingrain um, and really pull in is, is all different aspects of life changes, including being in schools. One modern development that, that we have in, in schools now in 2020 that um, it existed in the past, but not, not as, as much relevancy or um, severity or, or maybe as much as reality of things like active shooter drills or, or um, uh, the kind of locking the doors and shutting down emergency drills. Um, but at the time of, of the 1950s and the decade of the 1950s, there were other drills that they have then that we don't have now, just like there are different spaces in the region. So I grew up in Northern Indiana where the top end of maybe what would be considered tornado alley we're kind of a little bit more outside of it but we're still in that path that we had tornado drills going up and so if you lived in the northeast um you never would have really had that but it's something for the time and place that's necessary and so if you don't have that natural disaster it's not relevant to you one thing that's important in um in the 1950s is really think about coming off of world war ii and the prevalence of the building up of nuclear armaments, they created drills in case nuclear bombs went off. And you have something called duck and cover drills. Now, it's a very complex system, so I made a diagram down 
here for you. So what you're going to do first is you're going to duck, and then you're going to cover. Right? I know. And, and then step three for you experts is, is hold on to that desk. You're going to cover yourself. An atomic bomb goes off, and you're at school, so you can duck and cover up underneath something to prevent falling objects from falling on you. Um, now, obviously, this won't help if 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 it's dropping right on your school parking lot. It's it's cyanar. It ain't happening. But um, the idea is something to provide not so much solace, but but comfort and rhythm and, and order to what's going on. These are real drills that people did. Great resource. Check out Duck and Cover. It is an amazingly cringe-worthy video. If you have not already watched it, go watch it now. It's ten minutes. It's going to be a great ten minutes you're going to spend learning about the 1950s. But really get an idea. And, and so I think one thing that's really important with drills is practice. So let's gonna practice. You're gonna hear this crazy siren go off. It's gonna let you know it's time to do that drill. All right, folks, here it comes. Get under your desk, duck and cover, protect yourselves. I know, I know, it's so scary. You did it. You're so safe now. Now that you're ducked and covered underneath your desk. But this is something that seems a little bit ridiculous, but it is very real. Um, and like I said, check out that that wonderful cartoon if you have not yet done so. It is a gem. So those drills are a great piece of outside information um, for the SAQ, LEQ, DBQ that you could use and drop. Really great um, term that I, I, I like. I think it's a, it's a fun one, but it's a really easy one to remember. Um, but we're really gonna take a look now into what life is like in the 1950s. Now we had a president at the beginning of the 1950s, right, Harry Truman. He finished up FDR's fourth term after FDR dies and he has a term of his own and that's gonna end in 1952. And so in 1952 until 1960, we are gonna have a different president, President Eisenhower his modern view of what it means to be a Republican. So we got to think back about what Republicans used to be and so what that term modern Republicanism might mean. So in 1952, when we're really kind of building up this story, the backbone to all of these issues and really anything in the Cold War was one part. The issue, why is this happening? Communism. So when we're talking about um, foreign affairs issues, the fall of China to communism. What is this big issue with Korea? We don't want Korea to fall to communism. We have the fear of our foreign enemy, the Soviet Union, building up their atomic bomb, building up their hydrogen bomb eventually, short into 1950s. Um, and the fear is that these communists are going to attack us, destroy our way of life. Inside the United States, there's this fear of the communists, the Red Scare really taking over, um, and it, it's really going to set itself up for a huge change. People are going to associate negativity with the presidency and the presidential party that's in power at the time, in this case, the Democrats and Truman. And so people are going to flip the script a little bit. Um, they're going to jump political parties. But there are some similarities heavily from the effects of FDR that have really kind of made wide sweeping impacts on the United States. And so a World War II general emerges as a viable candidate. No presidential history, but he becomes so attractive for a couple of reasons. Um, he has this solution, this antidote for uh, an issue, a sickness that he believes the country has called K1C2. K1C2 is like uh, it's like a chemistry compound. There's this sickness, this this illness that we need to eradicate. And what does that stand for, you might ask? Korea, communism, and corruption. That Eisenhower is going to wipe out these problems from our country that we're having. He is going to be the person that's going to fix these problems. And America really buys into that. He is a vice president, um, Richard Nixon. That is the same Richard Nixon who will eventually become president. Um, goes hardcore after communism. He's actually involved in, in with McCarthy um, in the McCarthy hearings and, and attacks after corruption very, very heavily. Um, we have Eisenhower himself who vows that he is gonna actually go to Korea and personally end the war if he's elected. And Eisenhower is elected and he does actually go to Korea. And the way that he solves this problem is he goes into Korea, he completely overturns the entire United Nations Army's battle plan, and he really takes charge, just like he did, sort of as if he was back in World War II. And he threatens China for, with nuclear war if they don't 
back off if they don't uh, let the Koreans agree to some sort of a peace. And that's kind of how it does. It's almost like peace through force, which is sometimes a little bit contradictory. But he solves this within the first year that he's actually in office, which is absurdly quick after this war had taken um, uh, its toll for a couple years. So he is becoming extremely effective in just his first couple months. So Ike's looking really, really good. Um, now, that term I just use, Ike. Um, Ike is Dwight Eisenhower's nickname, um, a nickname from when he was a child. He still carries it with him. He prefers to be called that. So we'll kind of refer to him as that. And you're going to see it a lot of posters and buttons. But you'll look at this map that he uh, that 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 he wins in this election, 1952. Again, no political experience. Wins over 80 percent of the Electoral College vote. Right. Um, 55 percent of the popular vote. So he does very, very well. But again, we can see some political trends where the Democratic Party still is or where the Republican Party is more popular. The Democratic Party really having almost like a little bit of a linchpin on the southeast there with the exception of um, Florida. But for the most part, we can talk about why are these um, voters sticking with the Democratic Party? Why are certain voters flipping with the Republican Party, which are more swing states? But there's still a lot of change going on in our country. Now, to understand Eisenhower is not just to understand his political party, because we can really think in a, in a push, we really got to think large strokes here about changes over time. When we're talking about Republicans, we, so far we've really talked about Republicans um, heavily after the Civil War, when it was the party of Lincoln, and, and it was heavily focused um, on eradicating slavery, or Lincoln was more of a free soiler but a lot of this Northern-esque party. Then things start to change a little bit more in the Gilded Age, and they're much more pro-business and more laissez-faire, get those hands off type of approach, just let it fix itself. And that carries all the way through the 1920s into Hoover, and that is a huge blunder. Um, now, the Republicans are still more on that, that fiscally um, conservative side for sure, but Ike calls himself not a, just a hardcore true blood Republican, he is a modern Republican, his modern Republicanism. And what that's going to mean, it's going to be conservative. We're talking about finances, like government spending, balancing the budget. But socially, he didn't have this big um, desire or conquest to sh destroy and rip up the New Deal, maybe like the senators and, and representatives did um, during the Truman administration when they took control of um, Congress. But that's not really the case with Ike. He's very different in that he's Republican, um, maybe in his 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 fiscal policy, but as far as social policy, he's not. Um, and, and I love this quote that kind of sums it up. I'm conservative when it comes to money, and I'm liberal when it comes to human beings. So really, we're talking about who his um, kind of policies are molded after. Yes, his, his fiscal policy is much more Republican, but his social policy is much more FDR-esque. Um, and so that's really important. We talk about the longevity of the impact of FDR. Um, and he shapes, of course, the Democratic Party and really was the party of FDR until, I guess you could say, more modern day where um, Obama has really molded and shaped that. Uh, but it, it kind of roots back. The party of the Democrats in the 1900s and early 2000s is, is really the impact of FDR. Now, um, we're talking about how does this impact our life in the 1950s. Um, if we're going to have this hopefully really nice, cushy lifestyle at home, we need to be free of threats abroad. So his foreign policy is going to be hardcore, hardline. Think about what he just did in Korea. He threatened China to, with, with nuclear warfare, and that's kind of how he brought about peace. So he's going to go high risk, high reward, and he is going to talk a real big talk. Um, and, and it's going to work for a while. And there's a couple other factors that, that, that fold into that. But at home, there's going to be a real good life, very affluent in the United States, extremely high standard of living, the highest standard of living in all of world history. So we have a lot more to really see here. When talking about the Eisenhower presidency, um, we can, can focus on so many different aspects of it, but usually one of the biggest things we talk about is the affluence, um, the standard of living um, in the 1950s in the United States as the 
beautiful, beautiful time. He's going to serve as president for eight years, so he's going to win in 1952, and he's going to win again in 1956. Um, he's different than most Republicans, and he's not going to go out on this conquest to, to kill all these New Deal programs. He's actually going to add to some of them. He's adding to Social Security and the minimum wage. Um, and we are able to really avoid any catastrophic drop like we did um, after the First World War, once we got to the end of the 1920s, because of, yes, the New Deal um, kind of uh, support of those reform uh, programs that were instituted. But also, um, there's there's no inflation um, really at all. Like There's not this catastrophic um, inflation that completely devalues our currency. And then at the same time, um, our, our middle class really, really grows, is extremely strong and allows for a wide variety of people to access these finer goods, not just the higher class that you may have seen in the 1920s. He's going to use a lot of these things that FDR um, instituted. One of the best examples of this is his housing administration. Um, it's going to help subsidize and uh, help build and boom the suburban housing industry. Um, he's going to add on and create the Department of Health, Department of Education, Department of Welfare. But focus on those last three there, right? So these are government institutions, expansions of the cabinet. So the government is continuing to grow. Eisenhower is not shrinking the size of the government at all. He's actually continuing to help it grow. Um, and the other thing important is when these things are created, there's a reason that they're created. There's a purpose for them. So really focusing on, on the health, education, and welfare, um, he is all focusing on these things that are that are are, are what we need to focus on at this point. So that means education is booming, the concern of health, the concern um, for welfare, not just how well you're doing, but also like welfare as well as, as government aid and, and helping all people as possible. So there are a lot of changes going on here. One example of this change is the interstate highway system. So the highway system is probably one of the most iconic pieces of American culture in the 1950s because it really breeds so many other aspects. It's, it's the literal road that connects it all. Um, highways didn't exist in the United States until the 1950s, which is something that most people um, don't realize. The highway system is very, very new when we're talking about our country as a whole. Um, highways were not created initially for domestic use. That was not the number one purpose, although that is an effect, right? That's not the intended effect, but that was one of the effects of it. The whole purpose of the highway system was because we're still in the middle of the Cold War. These massive, wide, long strips that are the fastest way to connect from point A to point B, all of your major cities are meant for war. If we are going to be invaded and we need to bring planes and troops anywhere we need to, um, the fastest way is, is by, via aviation, but you need airports to land on them. You have these giant strips of track everywhere throughout these countries near these major cities. So you can move troops every, every which way possible. If we need to move jeeps, if we need to move tanks, if we need to move supplies, we can also do that by ground as fast as possible. No obstruction, no civilians. We can clear them out of the way and just gun it as fast as we need. Also, if civilians are in danger, say there's a nuclear attack and we need to evacuate people, it is the fastest way to get them out. Before this, you're, you're driving through country roads. Yes, you're driving through um, small towns, stop signs, stoplights. So it's not very conducive to long distance travel. The highway system changes all of that. So the intended purpose was for military protection, right, or for military need, but the actual effect and the usage of it, although that's not really ever used, the usage of it is going to be for trade. People are going to use it for vacation travel, even though it's originally in national defense. And what's amazing about this is all of these things that um, were used before this that pay for this are taxes on things exclusively used for this. It's not increasing their, their income tax or, or maybe taxes on their property or, or other things like that. If you have a car, there, there are taxes built in on your gasoline. There's taxes on um, the tires itself or just the cars themselves that funnel back to the government that help pay for all of this infrastructure to allow people to use. 
you can see these giant maps here, right? Or this giant map that really shows the interconnectivity between all these different regions. You can go from LA to Boston, um, and you can make that drive, or you can go all the way down to Florida, down um, the East Coast, from Maine down to Miami. And so you really have these options of connectivity. It's not just um, for civilian use, which is a huge piece of it, but also it changes the way businesses are done. Now, to make this even more extraordinary, you don't have to live in the same town that you work in. You don't have to live in the same area you're working in. So you can live in a much nicer area and work in a busier area that may be more crowded, like an urban center. So there's going to be a lot of internal migration patterns we're going to see. Because of the highway system's prevalence um, is, is partial is going to lead to the increase in car sales, but also the increase in car sales is also going to lead to why we can build the highway system. Um, cars at this time, they're going to be big bodied, they're going to be pretty long, um, a lot of storage, a lot of capabilities. It was almost like an extension of the house. And so it's a huge family experience in, in these automobiles and people do spend a lot of time in these cars. It's going to trickle into every aspect. American culture. You're going to have people that are driving everywhere. You have drive-in movie theaters. You're going to have bright colors. You're going to have these sleek bodies that are now put into this. It's no longer just functionality. It's also looking um, for how it's presented as well. And, and so the it's it's not just uh, function, but but form and, and, and look and appeal to these cars becomes a whole other aspect of this industry that affects the car industry as well. People are driving everywhere. You're driving to get to work. You can go drive to a different town for vacations. You can drive to eat. Um, you can go drive to visit family. It becomes extremely normal, and this interconnectivity becomes very, very quick, which allows for a whole different style of living. Um, people are much more mobile. They can go on these long trips. Um, they can actually experience different parts of the country, so there's more interconnectivity that way you can build these places where people can come miles and miles to travel to you can live further from your work so you can live in a really nice secluded area and work in a really really busy area where you can make a lot of money um, one great example is the concept of of disney's theme parks and vacation parks whether you go to the one down in florida or eventually the one out in california right disney world and disneyland that you can go and you can visit these attractions and this becomes a key key part of americana where people are flooding almost like a pilgrimage if you will at some points to um disney it becomes this national icon global icon eventually and it's all because of cars if you can't reach a location you can't go there right it's it's very simple if you don't have a way of getting there you can't experience that so because of this opening up of the highway system, it allows to build these, these international destination places that people can go to even before aviation travel becomes more common um, or really open to civilian use. Cars affect so many other ways of lifestyle. So um, you can even look at fast food restaurants or other types of restaurants in general where people literally looked like their cars as of their homes. Um, where they spent so, so much time in these automobiles that they'd have drive-up restaurants where people would serve you so you could sit in your car. The only major fast food restaurant that still actually does that would be Sonic, right? You can go up to like a Sonic and, and you could do that um, and they'll come out to you. But it's still, it's very, very odd now. But then it was extremely common. You would go and you would sit and you would eat almost like you were sitting at a restaurant, but you'd sit in your car. Um, you have changes like like... In McDonald's, which eventually become a walk-up self-service, where they stop the bellhop service, where they would almost be, where they would come out to your car and you would come up to the window, but then they mechanized the fast food industry, where they um, could sell bulk amounts of, of of food at a very high rate, and they could ship out these hamburgers quick, 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 quick. Um, they basically turned their kitchen into an assembly line, which revolutionizes other forms of businesses. It's not just the food industry; it's not just travel industry, but even movie theaters, they have drive-in movies. And some of these still do exist today, but they're not as popular, I would say, in modern day. There are still some that exist, and they're cool, and they're fun to go to, but um, you'll see more of a brick-and-mortar type place. But these drive-in movie theaters are so, so iconic for the 1950s. Again, it's experiencing everything in your car. They, they change the way that you access entertainment, you access 
um, these kind of luxury experiences and they become part of the normal American lifestyle. Now, um, when we are talking about food, especially we said the M word, we said McDonald's, we can talk about fast food. And fast food today um, is a little bit different than fast food then. We're talking about prices and, and how much they cost. Um, oh man, if they cost this much um, today, it would, it would be a real problem. But think about your go-to meal. You may have, you could pick one fast food restaurant real quick, get your meal. I'm a sucker for that Wendy's four for four, right? A little bit over four bucks. And, and I know what I'm going to get every single time. And, and, and maybe you're a chicken sandwich type of person, maybe you're a double stack type of person. It's your personal preference, but I know what I'm going to do when I walk up in there and I know exactly how much it's going to be and it becomes normal. But when we go back to the day, the golden arches, the drive in with the arches, McDonald's amazing menus, we can look at a couple things. One, right, we see this piece of Americana. Two, we can see the pricing to see how expensive some of these things are. And then three, the other thing we can really consider is how are they advertising? Advertising becomes a whole new business that really blooms and booms in the 1950s. Take a look at this. This would be dangerous if these were the prices, right? Look at that, 15 cents for a hamburger, 10 cents for French fries, right? Um, you can even get a glass of milk at McDonald's, which seems so odd. But all of these things also look at what they're called, the tempting cheeseburger, the triple thick shake, the thirst quenching Coke, the full flavor orange drink, right? They're very, very descriptive very um, kind of sensationalizing a lot of these things, really trying to draw people in. So advertising is huge. But this is um, commonplace across many different industries, not just the fast food industry, but this is one little entrance into kind of 1950s culture in Americana. So when we sum up the 1950s, you're really talking about post-World War II life. What is that really like? What are the implications of it? Why is that happening is the bigger question. So if you had to write something um, like a DBQ or an LEQ on 1950s culture, well, definitely you could talk about coming off of World War II just a, a little bit prior, but have to explain how does that cause the prompt? Right? How did that cause changes in the standard of living or the way that Americans live their lives? That's what contextualization is. So we're gonna to try to answer that question here. If you use World War II to try to contextualize a prompt about changes in American society in the 1950s. So it's caused by a couple different things and you could go into any one of these things if you wanted to contextualize a prompt about 1950s um, standard of living. Um, there's brand new desire for consumer goods which opens so many different markers, markets. Um, we have refrigerators, we have filters, cigarettes become extremely common. Smoking is huge in the 1950s. Doctors even encourage it so you could burn out all the nasty germs. It was good for you. Um, you have televisions, which is so, so important. Cars with automatic transitions, so no stick shift. Right? That's, that's a huge change. The learning curve becomes um, much, much lower, becomes much more simpler to do. So that means younger ages can really learn. And then even other forms of, of entertainment and music in hi-fi record players. But all of these different consumer goods were not really present in the 1930s and especially in the earlier half and most of the 1940s as a whole. And think about why. What was America doing in the 1930s? Hmm. Oh, yeah. The Great Depression. That's not going to be a really good time to buy these consumer goods. People don't have time for that. don't have money for that. Right? Who's even making those? And then, well, but what about the 1940s? Because the Depression's over by then. What's going on? Hmm. There's that little thing called World War II. Um, we're focusing things on just fighting the war, so we don't really have time or money or access for those things. The government is spending like crazy funding these industries. There's a lot of money in circulation. There's a lot of people buying, a lot of people selling, so the economy is doing very well as a whole from the top down. Why are we spending so much money? You have the Marshall Plan funneling all of that money, loans, across the world, and we're collecting money on those loans. The number two, funding, funneling and paying for the Korean War, all of the infrastructure perhaps um, to, to get out there, or we have um, the guns and the ammunitions, munitions, and, and that's a good way to, to make money for these industries, especially on the West Coast coming off of World War II. Also, there's the baby boom movement. So when a mommy and a daddy 
love each other very, very, very much, sometimes a stork comes along and they drop a baby on the front porch. And that's how babies are, are born and brought about, of course. Um, I know you know that by most of you probably being 17 or even 18 now. Um, that's really how it happens. Um, and the stork brought a lot of babies because mommies and daddies were very, very happy to see each other. Um, and because there are a lot of small children, there's a lot of desire for the entire baby industry that there's a lot more people now that are being created so that schools are going to start filling up. So teacher positions, and education is going to become its own industry as well. Um, people are going to move to the suburbs to have more space and be able to access these consumer goods because of this higher standard of living. So it's really becoming very wide sweeping. There's so many different areas of little nooks and crannies you could take if you want to continue as well on changes in life in the 1950s. And what's really extraordinary when you think about it is in 1950, America is going to, um, really in the 1950s, America is going to rise to the highest standard of living um, in world history in just one generation. So think about this for a moment, right? Say you were born near the middle end of the 1920s or maybe around 1930. We'll say 1930 for easy math, right? Um, you are, you're growing up, your, your early years and, and preteen and early teen years are, are the Great Depression and World War II. By the time you're, you're moving out on your own, the 1920s, maybe your early mid 20s, moving on your 30s, say you were born in the 1920s, a little bit older, then you're finally kind of having a family, settling down and having a job in the 1950s. Those children that you're having are going to be coming to age, being born in the highest standard of living in all of world history. That's a huge change from where you were as a child. And so being able to, to make that life better for your children than it was before. But the other important thing to understand is those children being born in the end of the 40s and the 50s never experienced the Great Depression or World War II. They never had that experience. Their whole world is wrapped up in what they live in, standard of living in the 1950s. So there's gonna be a lot of culture and expectation clashes as these decades continue. But really, all of this affluence and, and all of this wealth and high standard of living is really going to push a change for us. And it's going to be a push away from individualism, which we may have seen um, heavily all throughout the Gilded Age, right? Because that individualism is what can make a unique product, creativity and money, and even through the 1920s. Um, but starting with World War II, but especially into the culture of uh, 1950s and peacetime, conformity is the key word. Society is not encouraging individualism. They are encouraging conformity in every little aspect in mass production. We're going to see that throughout our discussion in this video. One basic way we're going to talk about conformity is gender roles. What are the expectations of men and women? We're going to start with women. Women um, are going to be depicted, especially in media. And think about this new medium we have to consume media now with television that they didn't have before. These are visual pictures and products in your home. There are color advertisements everywhere in newspapers, in magazines, on billboards, everywhere you go. Movies are being mass produced now because we're outside of wartime. It's much more for leisure. So there's a lot of different stereotypes, depictions of, of different genders and roles they can fill and conformity is definitely going to be huge. So the ideal woman represented is definitely going to be that of a housewife or a mother. In most cases, look at these all photos here. All of them dress similarly in, in dresses, the woman in the middle wearing pearls and these other women wearing jewelry, their hair done, um, wearing makeup, doing this cooking and cleaning in high heels all throughout the house. These are the depictions you're gonna see, but this is not it. Right? There's more. I'm talking about advertisements for products. How are products being sold? This one is 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 interesting. We'll say unique. Um, it's, it says married. No reason to neglect stockings. Right. That that's no reason to get to neglect your your stockings and your appearance just because you're married. Husbands admire wives who keep their stockings perfect. Wow. Isn't that just wow. Um, this is an advertisement for stockings, um, not leggings, but kind of pantyhose or, or what you would wear um, under a dress because you wouldn't want, again, still bearing your skin on the open like that. No, 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 not totally cool yet, but it's a little bit of a halfway, right? Um, but the other thing that, that I think really grabs um, my 
attention is you can see the text, of course, the arrow pointing directly at her legs. Constant runs are unsightly and expensive. Cut them down with Lux, but that's not me everything. You can see how she is depicted. Look at her dress. Look at her hair too, very similar to the last few women. What she's doing, she's just knitting, sitting at home. While the man, look at his face. Look how disgusted he is with those runs and those tears in her leggings. Oh, the horror. But it's kind of funny how bad it is. But again, the depiction, the expectation, this is going to make your husband happy if you can kind of keep your appearances up. Ladies, that's what you should be focusing on. Here's another one. Um, this one is for vitamins. Vitamins for pep. Pep for vitamins. And look who makes it down here in the corner. If you can read this. Kellogg's. The same people that make cereal. Yes, that is the same company. They branch out in a couple different ways. Many companies do that. But also the expectations, how they're depicted. The woman, high heels, um, dresses. She's got a duster in her hand, wearing full makeup, hair done. And the husband in his full suit coming home from work. Look at his little thought bubble. Right? So the harder a wife works, the cuter she looks. Ladies, this is how you're really going to grab your husband's eye. You can even go down to this little cartoon. If you can read it, I'll read it for you. It says, the husband says, gosh, honey, you seem to thrive on cooking, cleaning, and dusting. Thrive on that. And I'm all tuckered out at closing time. What's the answer? How do you do it? And the wife's response, vitamins, darling. I always get my vitamins. Right? This, this depiction of, of one, what women are doing and what their role is. And then number two, about how they, they are interacting with the opposite sex. Or even this one. Um, Schlitz is a beer company. You can see beer bottles below here. But this advertisement says, don't worry, darling, you didn't burn the beer. Right? At least I got my beer, even if you cook it, it's not great. But the expectation of of one, women, what jobs they feeling, and why is she so upset she burnt the food? This is so embarrassing. She's supposed to be a great cook. She's supposed to be a housewife. She can't provide for that, right? That sort of tongue-in-cheek joke that's like, ha-ha, but wait, there is a lot more to this. There's a lot deeper levels to this discussion, this depiction in media of what women and men are supposed to be. But this is just one side of the story, the female side. This is probably the best example of the expectations of women in society. This is from a, a very famous magazine that's printed all across the United States, um, Good Housekeeping. Um, Good Housekeeping has been around for quite some time, and it's still around today. But it's, it's a monthly um, publication, and this was printed back in May of 1955, so the middle of the 1950s. And the title of this article, as you can see, is The Good Housewife's Guide, or The Good Wife's Guide. So I'm going to take some time to read these to you, because um, they're a little bit small, and they'll zoom up and they'll change. But again, think about these expectations. Think about what's perhaps the most shocking to you. Would this ever, ever be in any sort of text today, or what would be the reaction to people um, if this was printed in publications today. Number one, the number one tip for being a good housewife, have dinner ready. Plan ahead even the night before to have a delicious meal ready on time for his return. This is a way of letting him know that you have been thinking about him and are concerned about his needs. Most men are hungry when they get home and the prospect of a good meal is part of the warm welcome needed. Two, prepare yourself. Take 15 minutes to rest so you'll be refreshed when he arrives. Touch up your makeup. Put a ribbon in your hair and be fresh looking. He has just been with a lot of work-weary people. Three, be a little gay and a little bit more interesting for him, meaning happy. His boring day uh, may need a lift, and one of your duties is to provide it. So that last one, whoa. Like that's, uh, again, that expectation of what women are supposed to be doing. But uh, don't worry, there is not just three tips on this list. It's much more, and it gets much more, um, let's say, shocking or interesting as we go along clear away the clutter right number four make one last trip through the main part of the house just before your husband arrives run a dishcloth over the tables during the cooler months of the year you should prepare yourself uh you should prepare and light a fire for him to unwind by your husband will feel he has reached a haven of rest and order and it will give you a lift too after all, caring to his comfort will provide you with immense personal satisfaction. 
Um, again, these ideas about what a, a woman should be doing, notice all of these different housework things, education that you're not out all day. Women would not, would not be out all day, men would be. And that, again, that last line, catering to his comfort will provide you with immense personal satisfaction. Um, the, the goal of women at this time, according to this one article. The next one, minimize all noise. At the time of his arrival, eliminate all noise of the washer, dryer, or vacuum. Encourage the children to be quiet. Right? These, these ideas that this is what you're doing, you're making all this noise, right? this is what you're doing all day, you're just cooking, cleaning, things like that. You need to make sure that you, uh, you really get around to making sure it's pleasant when he comes home. Next one, be happy to see him. <laughs> um, after that, greet him with a warm smile and show sincerity in your desire to please him. Listen to him. You may have a dozen important things to tell him, but the moment of his arrival is not the time. Let him talk first. And remember, his topics of conversation are more important than yours. Ugh, that's That one's pretty bad. Um, it, it, like I said, it gets a little bit deeper, but these expectations of, of not only what you should be doing, but how important these things may be um, based on your genders is gonna be very different. Um, next one, don't greet him with complaints and problems. Um, next one, don't complain if he's late for dinner or even if he stays out all night. Consider this as minor compared to what he might have gone through at work. These, this, this inability for, for wives to, to question their husbands, the expectation that they should be more submissive housewife. Again, very, very different than today. And these last ones are where it gets much more extreme or much more uh, uh, enraging for, for most of you. Um, next one, make him comfortable. Have him lean back in a chair, lie down and lie him down in the bedroom. Have a cool or warm drink ready for him. Like you're going to take care of my servant. Next one, arrange his pillows and t offer to take off his shoes. Speak in a low, soothing, and pleasant voice. Don't ask him questions about his actions or question his judgment or integrity. Remember, he is the master of the house and as such will exercise with his fairness and truthfulness. You have no right to question him. And then this last one, a good wife always knows her place, right? These things, this is printed in a a giant magazine. This is not like somebody's private speech. This is not somebody's journal. This is a well-read, this is a very popular monthly magazine throughout the entire country. This is not an isolated thing. So really understanding the gender roles, how strict the expectations of them are and how extreme they may really be. So the big takeaway we can look at when we're looking at women is that in media, women are basically exclusively, they're either mothers or they're housekeepers. That's that's pretty much how they're described and that's about it. But um, when we're looking at the reality of it, when we're looking at statistics, about 40% of mothers actually did have jobs. The reason was all this new technology, these new, say whether it be vacuums or refrigerators or different ways of preparing food, um, in, in previous decades, women stayed home. They had to make three scratch meals a day. You couldn't prepare or freeze anything and just pull it out and, and, and whip it together. You had to do every part of this meal from scratch, and that's a bulk of what they had to do all day. Um, now, with all these changes, women can go and they can go to work, and then they can come home and they can still prepare dinner. There's still that expectation. There's still a, a gender gap there of expectations and sexism for sure, but that is definitely um, a lot of options available. So that's not really represented in, in media. 20% of suburban women reported being dissatisfied, isolated, and bored. So it's not that people were content this lifestyle, there was this yearning for more, and eventually that's going to develop into actual um, progress or more ability as technology increases or it becomes more socially acceptable for women to take these leadership roles, whatever they may be. Um, and, and even though women were working, there is still kind of this gender divide in the type of careers that are deemed acceptable. Um, women then and even still now, and even when you look in film today, when we're talking about um, representation media, even in 2020 now, nursing, teaching, 
clerical jobs. Um, all of these things are, are the stereotypical representation when you see a TV show or a movie. Right? Um, there was a movie series, there's about two or three of them that came out um, in the early 2000s of a series called Meet the Parents or, or Meet the Fockers. Um, and in this movie, the whole running joke was that this man was a nurse and that this was the big, oh, you're not a doctor? Why aren't you a doctor? The woman's work. He's, he's working and delivering babies. And, and it was this huge, that was the whole premise uh, of this one character inside those films. And, and really, when you think about now, how much has changed of that, that expectation? There has been some change, but, but how large sweeping changes? Not that much. Now let's jump over to the men. So how are men depicted? They definitely are depicted um, in a different light, but there is this expectation that men um, are, are assumed to have to fill. Um, the ideal man was the boss. He was the provider, the breadwinner, right? Um, he's always going to be dressed up um, just kind of like women are, but they're going to be dressed up in suits, shirts, ties. That's the expectation normal feeling casual, maybe you'll throw on a sweater. But that is the expectation for men everywhere they go, even wearing the hats as well. Um, there's some really famous TV shows from the time period, and even the title um, really brings to light a lot. Father Knows Best is, is, is a very, very famous show from the 1950s. Just that, the kind of implications that come around with that. A great way of seeing that represented in media, that difference between men and women in the 1950s, or rather the expectations for men and women of the 1950s, you can check out in these two quick um, clips from the TV show Leave It to Beaver from the 1950s. It's a sitcom, so there's a laugh track and everything, but um, basically what happens in this bottom clip um, down here with the dad and the son, they're talking about, the son asks, how come when we're outside, you do all the cooking, Dad, and when we're inside, Mom does all the cooking? And kind of his answer um, of the expectations uh, of men and why men are better at certain things and women are better at certain things. And up in the top, um, the kid comes in. Um, really, he's talking about there's an IQ test at school, and he's really nervous about how bad he's going to do. And his, his kind of opening comments about why um, life is so much easier for women than it is for men and what their expectations are about Really, what do children understand of that basic, simplistic message? That's a really good way of understanding those. So take a look at those two clips. I'll leave the links down below. So in those last two video clips, you really can get a sense of, of kind of that, that humor. And you have to really think about why things are funny and why that's going to land. Um, and part of it is because if it's part of the, the kind of unexpected or that silly kind of ignorant little kid asking the question, doesn't really know, doesn't mean it perhaps in that way, right? Only can base questions off what they see. But again, the way that, that women and men are discussed in very large, open, wide casted television series, it's, it's one of the most famous American TV series probably of, of all time, especially back in the 1950s. And, and, and that I think is pretty telling what people are comfortable with seeing. Now, when we're talking about what people are comfortable with seeing versus what is the rules, if you will, what's normal versus what's portrayed in media, we can also look at um, types of behavior. So number one, right, obeying authority, obedience is super, super important. So you see that in a lot of different um, forms of media and text and representation. Um, and that includes even in the home as the man is the master of the house. And so wives and children, you must obey your fathers. You don't really, you don't really display your emotions out in the open heavily, right? You must control your emotions, be under control. You want to fit into the crowd. Conformity is the key word. Conformity, conformity, conformity. And when it comes to sexual activity and sexual expression, don't even think about it, right? These are the things that are kind of ingrained as the norms in society in the 1950s. However, when we look at statistics, we know that that isn't necessarily how people behave. That's maybe how they behaved when they're in front of maybe authoritative figures, but we know that sexual behavior in the 1950s really starts to change. Um, premarital sex is extremely common. Extramarital affairs, 
right? So cheating on your spouse are very, very frequent. Um, and so all of these stereotypes we see in media, not all of them are correct. So we really have to try to sift through everything. Not everybody was was pious and chaste. Um, and really, when, when looking at this, part of this could be this sense of, uh, of affluence that people that feel like they have choice in every realm of their lives, or that, for example, the automobile provides a lot more independence, and then that independence means that they're, on, they're out from, say, the watchful eye of a parent or authoritarian figure, and so that they can do things that maybe wouldn't be acceptable in front of them, but now they can do things a lot more in private. Think about the way that you have so much privacy in your conversations to an extent um, on on your phones and your text messages and those private messages or Snapchats between people. That's another way that that you have this privacy, you know, kind of what are you going to do with it? And people feel like they're not being watched and they can kind of do or say more so whatever they want. We're going to see even films that are going to represent a little bit of this um, promiscuity, right? The, even look at these, these movie titles, Don't Bother to Knock, um, How to Marry a Millionaire, or this one, Marilyn Monroe, this famous, famous symbol, right? Sex symbol, if you will, and all kind of those movies, this one. The seven year itch, kind of the sexual innuendos with all of these films. Um, but really understanding that not all stereotypes are true, and so we have to sift through to try to find that info. I think the best way to really get a grip on social values and social norms is through television in the day. So in the 1950s, um, television is, is everything. It becomes the new fad, the new mecca. Um, you can transfer not only just general entertainment, whether it be TV shows or musical performances, you transfer information and news. Um, you can transfer raw footage of events happening on the other side of the world. Um, and, and that is something truly extraordinary. But inside those entertainment um, videos, it's not just for laughs and giggles and, and to keep yourself busy. There's a lot of subversive um, kind of under the surface norms and things that can be passed on. Um, a best example of this, probably the most popular TV show of all time in American history, I Love Lucy. And in I Love Lucy, you can really see so many different things. It's a really cool story. And using Lucille Ball or the show I Love Lucy is, I think, a great outside piece of information for the SAQs, DBQs, LEQs, because Lucille Ball was way ahead of her time, right? If you're talking about the women's rights movement, she actually was more like the executive producer and the creator of what was called the Lucy Show. Um, and she really um, was hands-on in this business at a time when, when women were not. Um, but you can also talk about perpetrating some of these stereotypes where her character is simply just a housewife, you could say. Um, but there are other cavalier things about this, talking about the changing of times. Her husband in this show, Ricky Ricardo, is Cuban and and you can watch these episodes for yourselves. I left links to the my favorite two episodes of I Love Lucy. Um, and you can really get a good glimpse at gender roles. But her husband was um, Cuban in this show. Um, and Ricky Ricardo allegedly had too thick of an accent that the original producers were, were not comfortable with putting him as this um, main actor because his accent was way too thick that people couldn't understand funny when you have to listen to it's really not bad um but you can take a look um at, at those job switching is a great one if you're talking about gender roles um of jobs and what they do the husbands take the roles of the wives for the day thinking that they have their lives so easy and the women take the roles of the husbands they think their lives so easy and their discussions about what jokes are considered funny again how do these jokes land why are they landing why are they considered funny why is the laugh track going there um, even if it's something that's a little bit more shocking. That's kind of the part that we can really analyze here. Um, but really, whether you're talking about radio or we're talking about magazines, TV is going to replace either one of those that we used to hold that special spot. The radio in the 1920s, 30s, um, and even into the 40s was the choice of um, American culture, but um, of, of conveying it. But but TV surpasses all of that. And it's a really unique, special place in American culture today. We still get so much of that.
So if we're talking about affluence, we've used that word quite a bit. We're talking about this high standard of living. We got to talk about money. If you look at this chart, this is the average family income um, over the decade. So from 1950 to 1960, the average income almost completely doubles. That's a lot of extra income and cash flow to have going around. And so advertising and all of these other consumer goods are really going to latch onto that. Take a look, for example, at this right here. Um, you have an advertisement for a refrigerator, but you can also look at, yes, the goods and, and that ability um, to have those goods, but also look at the depiction of women in here. Want to be a kitchen juggler? Why juggle so many foods to get a few? And look at this convenience. It's going to save your life. They're advertising towards women, not men. But also look how they're depicted in, in all of these um, these advertisements as, as housewives, again, and, and the, the full dress and hair and the pearls, the whole nine yards, the whole get up. Um, we have other examples of luxury goods like the waffle maker. Um, again, these things are great. Do you need them? Absolutely not. You don't need them, but they're absolutely fantastic. We have a lot of extra money to buy frivolous items like this, luxury goods like this. Um, television sets. Ooh. Yes. Now, when we're looking at these television sets, notice the size of these. And these are the ones that are being advertised by Motorola, the people that now make almost exclusively phones and make other things. But that's kind of what they're more known for in the U.S. right now. But the size of these TVs, a 16-inch TV or up here at the top, a 20-inch TV. Um, both of these are so, for this time, considered solid size TVs. Now, for us, the people may have TVs bigger than this. Um, in their bedrooms or the bathrooms or their kitchens. But when you take a look at this, even these descriptions, you may not be able to read this one for the 16 inch TV, but it says you'll marvel at the brilliant realism of this life-size 16 inch rectangular screen, right? That this is what the entire family would come around. It's not by our standards big enough by any means, but at this time, this was revolutionary. You even see the, the evolution of Tupperware. And back on that discussion of the refrigerator um, advertisement as well, really think about what implications this has. Yes, there's a lot of sexist um, representation in media, for sure. But the evolution of things like the refrigerator and the freezer and Tupperware and storage and, and, and the use of food and how you're able to conserve it revolutionizes the lives of so many different people, um, namely um, those that are that are living at home and in the middle class and upper classes at this time, the middle class especially because women now, if they want to, they can go and they can go get a job because they don't have to spend every single day making three meals from scratch. Um, they can just get up, go, and they can go to work. They can come back, and it saves so much time out of their day, the, the preservation of food. So it really does change things for them. Um, you still will see all these different forms of advertising. Again, you're going to see a lot of women advertised with um, cleaning materials, like you see her posing with this vacuum, the pause that refreshes at home. Or automobiles and the depiction of the family, right? There's a lot of consumer luxury goods that really do come out. Um, but with that comes a lot of buying on credit. Um, this is the total in millions of dollars of credit um, outstanding. Um, meaning how much is extra dollars of credit left um, that's not yet paid. A lot of it for consumer goods from 1945 to 1960. So there's this trend with the 1920s. Oh, no, are we doing the same thing? And so you may receive a prompt perhaps that could compare the 1920s and 1950s, but we're going to see maybe how well the protections of the um, New Deal provisions that were put in, um, the different reforms that were put in, are these going to help us or are we going to fall through the same loopholes that we did before? I guess we'll see in the future. It's not really possible to fully talk about the um, story of the 1950s without talking about the baby boom. OK, boomer, here we go. So when we're talking about the 40s and the 50s, um, the baby boomers are, are the generation of, of people. It's technically considered from 1945 all the way up until 1963. But um, the height of it's really going to happen in the 1950s. And we already talked about how babies come, come to be when the stork drops them off when mommies and daddies love each other very much. Very excited to see each other after spending many long, grueling years at war. Very excited. And so a lot of babies are going to be born. A lot of human making going on. Um, this baby boom is, is going to happen. In 1957, on average, a baby was born every seven seconds. That is a lot of children. 
because of that, in our capitalistic system, people will find ways to monetize off these new ideas. Gerber Foods, for example, entire baby industries are born, whether it's the food industry, whether it's the baby literature, or even if it's something like toys, right? Fisher Price is still around today. Um, my grandmother used to have this awesome toy that when we came over to her house, we'd get to play with and we were always fighting over. Um, but it was like a giant pedal car, like the Flintstones in red and yellow, these, these bright colors. But this was all about an entire new industry being born because of this education industry, healthcare industry, childcare industries are also really blooming because of the amount of children around. You can also see the amount of school enrollment. And it's very important to understand this graph. This doesn't tell you how many people were born at this time. It says how many people were enrolled in school from K to eight during this time period, 1910, 1920, 1930. So understand this gap between um, 1920 and 1930 is really going to be um, because of the roaring 20s. So people are being very successful by here, 1930 to 1940. Why is there a huge, huge drop here? Hmm, let's see. Oh yeah, the Great Depression. World War II breaks out. So World War II happens from 1939 to 1945. America gets involved in about 1941. And so after the war ends in 1945, there is an increase of a little bit of standard of living, but it's not a huge jump. All these children are being born now by 1960 when they're in right, lower elementary school. So anywhere from five all the way up to, to grade eight. So you're looking around 13-ish, right? That's a huge spike, all these children now being born that are actually seen in schools and then continued even further up into the 1970s. So there are definitely changes in society as a result. So education becomes much more important. There's a huge enrollment in school, which wasn't necessarily the norm before. Once we start talking about the amount of people that are increased, population increase, we can also talk about how other ways it's gonna impact besides just the boom of a baby, um, marketing and baby food and baby um, toy industry. Um, we can also talk about how it's going to change the way and places that we live. So because of this extra access to um, funds and money and that population is growing, people need places to live. And because of this access to funds and the innovation of the automobile, people can work in different places um, then they live. And so people can work in a big urban city, but they can live in a more peaceful, calm, um, subdued, uh, secluded area than actually in that urban center. So a lot of blue collar and white collar workers can now actually live in the same area, which wasn't necessarily the case before where you needed, especially if you were one of these lower collar, um, lower caliber workers or lower level workers on the totem pole, right? You had to live where you were to save money and you had multi-generational families inside of um, the same tenants um, that we saw in the Gilded Age. But if you move to these new areas, now you have a different way of accessing materials. It's not just where you live. You need food, you need any other consumer goods. There's all these other stores that really start to open up. So Suburbs because become really independent up on cars and grocery stores and shopping centers and all of these things really start to build out there. So more construction is going to come, more forms of business are going to come into these different towns. Um, the life inside of these homes is not going to be the extended family, but there may only be two or so bedrooms, but people have enough money on their own that they can separate and they're going to have their own homes. So the nuclear family, mom, dad, and and say two kids. Um, and, and then in addition to that, there is also demographic changes, so complexity. Not everybody moves to the suburbs. Um, there are going to be um, a disproportionate amount of African Americans left behind in the urban centers because of their lack of access to the same level of increase that whites may be able to experience, a sort of glass ceiling if you will. And that phenomena of all or almost all of this white population migrating out of the urban center to the suburbs um, is called white flight 
and really leaves behind the urban core or structure of the city as being more predominantly African-American. So we can make the claims that in the 1950s, there was a drastic increase in the standard of living, but not all Americans experienced it in the same way. There were laws and rules that were put up that prevented African-Americans still from buying homes in certain neighborhoods. Um, and so that made it very, very difficult in certain areas for African-Americans to really try to get ahead. An example right, of these suburban lifestyle homes is in Levittown, New York. Levittown, New York began really as um, a system set up to rent homes to veterans coming back from the wars and getting them kind of back on their feet, giving them a position to buy. It became so, so successful. And as more people wanted to move out of the urban center and had all this extra money, they really recognized that they could mass produce these homes at a very quick rate, and it boomed from 1947 up to 1951 to 17,000 um, homes sold um, during this time period. And, and you look at this massive grid work all throughout and how expansive this system was. Um, they were able to mass produce it, um, and mom and dad and the two or three little kids can live in this very simple American style home, this Americana right dream of the 1950s. You can pick one of the two style homes. You can have a Cape Cod or you can have a ranch style house. Some of you may have a style of house like this, but this kind of, or you may live in a neighborhood like this where there's a lot of homes that they all look really, 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 really similar. Maybe it's all in color tone. Maybe it's all in shape, but you can build these on a very large scale very, very quickly. And there's not necessarily that individuality. They're all looking the same. Um, this has come up on the AP exam a couple times, but there's different songs and artists of the time that will critique sort of this mass production. There's a song called Ticky Tacky Little Boxes. Um, and the lyrics have been used, I believe, in the multiple choice section at times. Um, what in the past, I think, two or three years, they've, they've come up in, in, in some forms of the test, not in all of them but in 2018 and 2019. And uh, it's really this critique about the conformity of, of what's going on in this country at this time of this mass production, everything is being mass produced. This area of the suburbs is really where you're gonna see the largest amount of growth or the quickest amount of growth. But with that comes a lot of other things that, that may not be as overt, but things we can start to trickle in. It's a piece of information, this cause and effect relationship. Because people have this extra money and because of changes that have come over time and we're in a time of peace and affluence, um, there's a lot more free time. And, and a lot of these conservative values are really going to start to trickle back into society. We're talking about the prevalence of religion and, and church membership is definitely going to increase. Um, and, and when you're talking about um, this increase in religion and church membership, there's definitely going to be um, this sort of definition of, of where you're going to live or who you are based on the neighborhoods that you really live in, sort of like the ethnic cultures that that build up in the inner city, but more in a suburban sense is more just religious aspects. Maybe it's a Jewish community or a Roman Catholic community or, or Protestant um, community, and that's really where they're going to see pockets of, of, type of people of similar belief systems in, in the same general area. It's not segregated in, in that sense, but it's much more prevalent to happen that way. You're also going to see um, things like at the federal level, the Pledge of Allegiance, we're going to add in phrases of religion. So we add in that phrase after one nation under God, really stapling in that, that religious value in our pledge to our flag that students say every single morning um, in schools all across the country. Um, it's it's twofold thing. One, connection to... Um, the culture of the time when we're talking about heavy religious influences. But two, the other big thing is we're fighting against communism. We're still in the middle of the Cold War. We're not talking about any violence yet, but we're talking about a lot of prosperity and peace. But during the Cold War, communism does not allow for religion. And the reason why it doesn't, under, it doesn't allow for these institutionalized religions is because religions have hierarchies of systems of people inside the church, and that inherently becomes unequal. And so under um, the systems of communism, our religious principles also go by the wayside. Public schools are going to grow because of this um, amount of people flooding to the suburbs. So that's going to be very different. 
college education also becomes a very, very achievable goal of, of people living in the middle class, giving something better than what they had. Past generations, that wasn't the case. You had to work. If you were a kid in the Gilded Age, you were in the factories once you could get a job so you could get more money for your family, and that was the norm. Um, the Great Depression, if you get a job, great. People couldn't pay for school. Same thing in, in World War II. That's not what you were focusing on. So people had a lot of changes. Um, uh, in culture of people have had a lot of changes throughout the years, but especially once we hit the 1950s, education becomes the norm um, and kind of that standard of what people are striving for is to go to college. It becomes obtainable, not just this myth and this dream where only the upper, upper class get it, but it's achievable for so many different people. An example of this, right, we can see people actually taking advantage of that college education post-World War II, the GI Bill. Remember, GIs are World War II um, soldiers, kind of the nickname they get because everything being general issued, government issued. Um, and they are able to get a college education paid for by the federal government. So a lot of people are getting highly educated now um, that are really taking um, advantage of this government aid. But not everybody is always necessarily following the the rules in in um, media, and we see different depictions of what reality is versus what um, we're seeing. Different depictions, juvenile delinquencies, huge, crazy kids, kind of these rebels without a cause. Um, this movie, like Teenage Crime Wave, cool and the crazy, date bait, all of these things of of pushing the the button of of the norms and this kind of desire of the things that maybe they don't have bad boys, the bad girls, the, the kids that are really pushing that limit. A great example of this sort of cultural change is when we look at the music of the 1950s. Um, the early 1950s was dominated by a style of music coming from the 40s called doo-wop, which a little bit of snap in. It's not swing music, but it's a little bit more happy, upbeat. Um, and then we have things with um, changes to music, such as rock and roll, which becomes extremely extremely popular with young listeners the older audiences are definitely not as keen to it they find it maybe too subjective too inappropriate whatever it is um, but that's not a trend that really goes away very often this culture clash between the past generation and the current generation think about maybe how your parents react to music on the radio or music you may listen to um, or, or, or what they think of it um, might be an example of this cultural clash it's no different in the 50s um, there's a lot of different artists at this time period that, that are major rock and roll stars, but it's not rock um, like this, the, what we would determine today when you hear rock music with these just heavy, heavy guitar solos and heavy drums and it being um, much more kind of aggressive. Um, it's, it's rock and roll. It's a little bit more bluesy, which is kind of where it all kind of comes from is, is the blues. So it's not really what you would think of. It may be a little bit more similar to kind of what you would consider more along the lines of like an R&B style-ish. Um, you have a lot of black artists. My favorite um, rock and roll um, artist from the time period is definitely Ray Charles. Love Ray Charles. But there's other famous names like Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, Little Richard. And there are also some major white artists as well. But understand that both of these type of artists are going to hit the mainstream and so regardless of the community you live in, you can live in the suburbs, you can be in an all-white suburb, but you can hear the voice of Ray Charles, you can experience different types of culture and music really kind of brewing. Then there's some also really famous white rock and roll artists, um, Jerry Lee Lewis, Roy Orbistein, Buddy Holly, and probably the most famous rock and roll star in American history, Elvis Presley. He's also probably one of the most controversial artists of his time. He was America's bad boy. He danced differently. He sang differently. He was a little bit sultry, maybe a little bit seductive. A lot of dancing with a lot of hip thrusting made him a, uh, a very controversial topic for a lot of parents. They did not want their children listening to Elvis Presley. Elvis had so many hit songs. He was a household name. Everybody knew who he was, whether you hated him or loved him. Everybody knew who Elvis was, and he's still one of those names that people still know today. Um, he made girls swoon left and right. He was just a heartthrob, to say the least. But he was, like I said, very controversial. This is a picture of a pastor um, in, in a uh, suburban community holding up an Elvis Presley poster um, down in Florida that 
and just really preaching about how inappropriate this is, that rock and roll is a sin, that rock and roll is the devil's music. But even with these record players, if uh, parents found that you were listening to this music, they would be so angry, so upset. They, you see scenes from movies where they come and they snap the record in half. You're not going to listen to this devil music in my house, right? Just breaking all of these norms. So there's definitely a culture clash going on. But this sort of culture clash in teenage culture really is a huge moving force in the 1950s. It's what's moving product. It's what's moving songs. It's what's moving the way things are made. It's what's going to move the next generation as well. Um, what's unique about teenage life in the 1950s is they were the first group to really have leisure time. They were spend a lot of money um as well this hasn't happened in past generations because you were working you didn't get to go um you didn't to get to go to to school and have this leisure time off just to spend just to be teen so the 1950s is really the first decade where teenagers really exist um dances are extremely common it's a social event the people going out dancing every single weekend and and this was a really really big thing to do as a social atmosphere um, and then also everything can be done in the car. Like I said, extension of the home, there's a lot more privacy, a lot of, uh, little, uh, making out there in the car, but it, it's, it's a lot of these different little changes that may seem a little bit more subtle, but all of this freedom, teenage culture really doesn't exist until the 1950s and from there, it becomes a key part of, of kind of American culture. We see it in advertising and selling and dancing. Uh, and, and trying to make everybody seem cool, and this is what you want kids to do, and this idea of you want to be in the in crowd, whether it's this advertising on um, uh, on records and, and who these things are made for, things targeted exclusively for teenagers. But not everybody was into this. Here is a great complexity alert. Jack Kerouac is an awesome name. He is an anti-conformist movement leader of the 1950. Jack Kerouac and the Beats movement, also known as the Beatniks, were really uh, a counterculture movement in the 1950s. Not everybody was buying into the cookie cutter culture. A lot of people began to question um, the positives of this and really criticized American for um, falling into all these different social pressures. You are going to see this idea that we can reach a higher level of thinking that there's going to be this this anti um, eventually an anti-establishment movement in the 60s and 70s, which eventually what will kind of form into the hippies. But the root of the hippies movement and this counterculture movement really comes from the beatniks in the 1950s. They really pop up very popular on the West Coast in San Francisco is a huge hotbed for the beat um, movement, whether these are um, kind of artists, not necessarily in the sense of musical artists, but writers for sure. Jack Kerouac has a couple famous books, um, but there are also different forms of visual artists as well that really take Examples of that really comes in abstract expressionism, right? So abstract, it's not necessarily going to be conformed into this perfect shape. Um, expressionism, it's a different way of expressing. So it's not going to be realism like we've seen in past examples of art. It's purposely not trying to do that. And some of the most famous American art, some people may say, oh, my God, this is literally just my toddler could do this, just throw this, this art um, together, but it's just random strokes of pain and people throwing stuff on pages. But it's not exactly that simple, number one. But number two, part of that's the point. It's not supposed to look like anything. Right? Um, this is probably one of um, the more famous art pieces by Jackson Pollock, um, famous American artist um, during the 50s. Um, a critique on just kind of this mass production realism, stretching the constraints of what realism is. Um, we see Mark Rothko exam examples that it doesn't necessarily have to look like anything. It's not supposed to. Why should it have to? And really pushing these realms of individuality. Or might be the most famous American artist of this time period, Andy Warhol. And you may have seen photos done in this styling. right? All of these pictures of the famous um, actress at the time, Marilyn Monroe, all these different shades, hues, colors. But everything and everyone is being mass produced. And that's sort of his 
critique that there is no individuality. All we're doing is we're just rinse and repeat. We're trying to keep up with the Joneses. And all we're doing is everybody has the same thing. Every little thing. Maybe that song that you remember when we were talking about the um, 1950s houses in Levittown, the ticky tacky little boxes. This one's green, this one's red, this one's blue. They're all looking the same. All these people living in the same style of houses. All these people looking the same. And this is usually what makes people laugh, but this is one of the most expensive American art pieces um, that exists. It's this massive collection of original Andy Warhols, paintings of Campbell Soup. But all of these things in America, his message essentially is that everything is being mass produced. So you can look at this conformity discussion through literature, you can look at it through visual arts, you can look at it through advertising, you can look at it through housing, you can look at it through so many different lenses, this is just one way that we can really see it and hit it, but another way that we can dig into that complexity discussion. There are some things that Eisenhower does actually deal with um, in terms of foreign affairs. It's not all he deals with. Um, most things we focus on the prosperity of the 1950s, but we're going to take a look at some of these foreign affairs issues he sort of runs into. Ike was oddly, I don't want to say perfect, but, but a really, really good fit for being a Cold War president, just coming off of World War II, being very successful. Um, and he has some very clear goals on how to, uh, about what he wants to accomplish and then how he's gonna accomplish them. Um, it kind of comes down to two things. Number one, super strong stance against communism. His, his way that he's gonna get that done is what he calls massive retaliation, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, nuclear weapons are not off the table and neither is the use of the CIA in covert operations. And then number two, the other side of that is to reduce the amount of money we're spending on national defense and hopefully bring about peace or relaxing of the tensions. And, and goal one and goal two don't usually sound like they go together, but I'm gonna try to build that up to, to show you his mindset and how that's gonna happen. But remember, Eisenhower has a lot of experience um, he was the World War II general in, in Europe and in Asia. He fixes the war in Korea really, really quickly. Um, he's super well organized. Again, that militant right organization. Um, and he's a really good diplomat. He's really good at negotiating and, and getting things done. To make things even more interesting, the leader of the Soviet Union since the 1920s, Joseph Stalin, is going to die. And when he dies, the Soviet Union is going to go over this sort of uh, quick power struggle of who's going to take power. But they're going to have a little bit less stability, and the United States will have more stability. So it's going to allow for different foreign policy to be much more effective in this realm. So with Eisenhower, Eisenhower really wanted to cut down on the amount of money we're funneling in the defense industry. And one way that he sees that happening is is through the production of nuclear weapons and really long range missiles, not necessarily the use of a lot of human capital and, and sending these ships over there and a lot of this ground war, but we can attack and do battle if need be, then stocking an entire huge army because it's not just getting the supplies for them and their pay, but their food and transportation, all of these different things that come along with it. So he really wants to, as it says up there, wants more bang for his buck. So he wants to get more and, and pay a little bit less. And so the way to do that in his mind is, is something called massive retaliation. So it was this idea that we would target very key specific locations to really try to um, force the hand of our enemy. So they may do something, but we will threaten a huge, huge repercussion, and they have to follow through on that, of what's going to happen. Now, the use of nuclear weapons hopefully would then become unlikely so that this nuclear war would not break out too, because that war would be very expensive. Um, but if we threaten them with this really, really, really big threat, um, and they don't agree to these demands, or they don't agree to peace, there's no other course of action, right? It's kind of like in active shooter drills 
um, or these lockdown drills that you're supposed to stay in the corner and stay quiet. And that works all well. But until that once that dangerous person gets in the door, it kind of opens up the huge flaw in that. And it's no longer valuable. So if we threaten them and say, we need to do this or else. And they say, I don't really care. Where are we going to go from there? What's our next step? We don't really know. Um, this is really heavily relying on a, another term. And so these two terms are going to be kind of lumped together to really understand Ike's foreign policy. It's something called brinksmanship, really kind of going to the brink of war is what that term sort of means um, to accomplish the goal. Like it, it, it will be threatening to use these really big weapons, and Ike is not afraid to talk the big talk. Like, he'll he'll say, I'll pull the nuclear weapon out. He did it in Korea. I'll, we'll drop this bomb on you real quick. Do not test us, right? Now, it, 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 eventually, it's not really an actual threat, but we want to build up to show them that we have these really big weapons that we can use. Don't make us use it. Sort of like the big stick diplomacy of TR, right, Roosevelt, way back in uh, in the early 1900s, except for not really hoping to use them. But it's it's kind of trying to flex our muscles to, to show them, here's what we can do, don't make us do it. You can really lead to some, some big things. Now, the problem is, is what if somebody calls your bluff? That can lead to huge, devastating, devastating effects. Different forms of technology are really going to allow Ike to, to play with that, that brinksmanship, that um, uh, the massive retaliation threats, and part of it's going to be through ICBMs. Um, ICBMs are intercontinental ballista, ballistic missiles, meaning we can shoot missiles from one continent to another in between continents. So you can shoot from one continent to another continent then go really, really long ranges. They're highly explosive. So we can be very far away and hit them without actually having to send troops. And we can threaten them. They know we can hit them. We don't have to be right in their backyard to move in really close, like we did perhaps um, in World War II, taking the islands, uh, islands of Iwo Jima or Okinawa. There's also submarine launch pads that can be used, or nuclear submarines, which I think are personally very scary. One, hate the idea of submarines trapped in a metal box under the, under the sea, but also being able to carry these highly volatile weapons from anywhere and shoot them out of the water. But the problem is, um, is really what's at stake here. If you're threatening people with huge amounts of nuclear destruction, not actually acting on it, but threatening them with these huge, huge threats and that we're going to go after these targets and we can hit you from anywhere, that if the enemy takes you seriously, they may start to build up their weapon. But part of this agreement is that if you fire at us, we will fire at you with overwhelming force and we will destroy you worse than you can destroy us. We have nuclear warheads. We can hit you from, from different angles all across the world. You'll never be able to stop at all. But this could lead to mutually assured destruction or MAD. This mutually assured destruction is saying that basically everybody has missiles pointed at everybody else. So if you pull that trigger, right, then you're going to have to expect that someone else can pull it right back at you. So it's kind of this standoff, this stand down, if you will, um, that's trying to happen, this little dance in, in the political realm. And we're going to see this happen a couple different times in Ike's presidency, showing kind of that power and that force of that threat of what we can do. So in the beginning... Right, of, of Ike's presidency, so two years in, he'd already dealt with um, China in, in, in the Korean War, but China is still going to attempt to expand. Um, there are islands near Taiwan, which is off the southeastern coast of mainland China, and Eisenhower is going to threaten China with nuclear war if they don't stop expanding and try to stop that hard, hard expansion by the Chinese containing communism. So we've evolved our foreign policy from Truman, which was just containment. Now we're a little bit into uh, a larger threat and usage of this with uh, brinksmanship and mutually assured destruction that the Chinese didn't know if he was bluff bluffing. So they really do back off. It's a brand new president and they know his reputation as being a World War II general. So his reputation really carries a lot here. He's able to be successful with these threats. Ultimately, what Ike was hoping to do was hoping to drive a little bit of a wedge between the Soviet Union and China and break up this really deep alliance. And then you can start to 
break down the communist foothold from there. Um, it was hope, it was his hope that by the end of the 1950s, this alliance would, would really be done. It doesn't really um, happen, but it's this attempt of one plan of bringing the lessening of the tensions down, eliminating this threat, the Soviet Union, from all of its allies that eventually, hopefully, we can get them onto some peace negotiation terms, hopefully. So um, we have our, our conflicts even then bleeding into other parts of the world, this kind of crux between Africa and Asia, right, right up the uh, northeastern corner of Egypt. And there are a lot of problems that are happening in this region. You may remember we talked about this general region here um, when we were talking about the Truman Doctrine and sending aid to Greece. You can see the outline here or Turkey right here, trying to create a little bit of a buffer zone, if you will from um, communism spreading into Africa, which at this point is relatively protected from it. But um, what happens is our ex-allied forces, the French and the English, are gonna actually invade Egypt to take control of the Suez Canal, which is right here. The Suez Canal, as you can see, is this waterway which connects the Mediterranean Sea into the Red Sea. It is almost like this line that's completely controlled and blocking off that remaining chunk um, from Asia that you can almost set up a wall, if you will, the, of democratic countries. The problem is um, the Soviet Union is vastly against this. They feel that this restricts the free trade of these other countries, their ability to access these other countries, or um, these other countries' ability to trade, and, and they're fearful that they're going to be almost locked out of this region. So they're going to be vastly opposed. So where does the United States fit into this whole issue? The United States fits in when Eisenhower really gets involved and he is really fearful of the Soviet Union attacking Quebec brawl out into a war. So his way of preventing this attack is a really, really, really big threat. Um, his threat with the Soviet Union is we will drop atomic bombs on your land if you do not back off. If they start something, we may have to hit them. And if necessary, with everything in the bucket, we're going to use everything that we have. We're really trying to prevent them from attacking this region to really create this buffer zone. How this whole thing ultimately pays off, again, this is a use of brinkmanship, willing to go up to the brink of war and threaten these really big threats, willing to uh, threaten massive retaliation if they take this action. England, France, and the Soviet Union all leave Europe, and that's how this whole thing de-escalates. De the problem is the United States is now left in this region trying to sort of become the leader and the protector of it, because it's not so much that we want this region, we just want this region not to fall by the communist wayside, so we feel like we can't leave. America's involvement in the Middle East is starting all the way back in the 1950s, folks. This is not just something that happens right after 9-11. This so-called Suez crisis is just one example of the communist threat in our mind expanding around the world, expanding into the Middle East. We have the expansion of the Cold War into Europe and into eastern parts of Asia um, in the Truman presidency. Now, right now, we're in the Eisenhower administration and we're seeing expand into the Middle East, that crux between Europe Asia, and Africa. Um, and so Eisenhower kind of announces this doctrine. Truman does it, as does Monroe in different time periods for different reasons. But that this recommendation that America puts armed forces to protect the Middle East from communism, that again, it's this fear that we cannot allow this region to fall. They're either with us or against us. Um, America becomes now more of a police power in this region of the world. It's not like the Monroe Doctrine or the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, where it's just the Western Hemisphere. Now we're heavily in the Middle East, and we're going to have a large presence there for over half a decade, even still today. It's going to lead to a lot of anti-American tensions here, as there will be in Latin America. But ultimately, with this whole story building, by 1957, we even sent troops to Lebanon. Um, we tried to halt um, communists expanding there. We put in a pro-Western government. And we're going to be putting up a lot of leaders in different countries that's going to create a lot of animosity. They're going to be seen as like foreign puppets for the United States. That is not the only way 
that Eisenhower really tries to do with the Cold War. He's going to use a lot of covert actions. Um, we're going to have a lot of anti-American um, sentiments brewing in the Middle East and Latin America. And we're hoping that regardless of what happens, as long as they don't fall to communism, everything is justified. That includes overthrowing um, governments in Iran, which is a huge country that we are still involved in, have been involved in for quite some time. Um, we overthrow the leader um, in Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh, um, and really we put up a more U.S. friendly shot, and he becomes seen as just this American overwatch sitting there. He's going to become a target um, definitely in the 1970s. In um, Guatemala, we overthrow a regime there. And even in the end of Eisenhower's term, he really tries to take a hardline stance against a Cuban dictator, even plans a uh, invasion into Cuba. He never actually carries it out, but plans an invasion into Cuba to overthrow and assassinate the new dictator that takes hold in Cuba just off the coast of Florida, Fidel Castro. Do not forget Castro. He's going to become a really big player in the very near future. This whole foreign policy is not just limited to other continents on Earth. This foreign policy is actually going to take us to space for the first time. Um, in 1957, the Soviets actually beat us to space, so the Americans are not the first people to space. Um, we actually are, are going to be deeply disturbed by the Soviets successfully launching the satellite Sputnik. Now, Sputnik in Russian literally translates to satellite, so the satellite satellite is actually launched into space, and um, Americans start freaking out because we don't really know what's going to happen next. We are behind the curve now. We are losing this Cold War race with the Soviet Union. The reason why satellites are so important, they're going to allow us to really use these intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, because they need to know where to hit. They need to know where to go. And these satellites allow that GPS system um, if you will, to, to really get that missile from point A to point B of detonation. When this goes up, the new Soviet leader of, uh, of, the, of the USSR, Nikita Khrushchev, Khrushchev is a huge name, not to be forgotten, um, is, is really going to take um, Sputnik and, and use it as, as definitely a fear tactic one, but there's military and, and just advantages to it. But the biggest thing is really the perception of everything. Um, this sort of message that, that he puts out, we will bury you, your children or your grandchildren will live under communism, that the Soviet Union is, is coming back with a force. This is the new Stalin, if you will, that he's taking the country in a totally different direction. Um, and so as a result, Americans really speed up their plans to build any ICBMs or IRBM submarines. IRBM is intermediate range ballistic missiles. Um, so medium range versus really, really long range. There's all of these types of, uh, of warfare that's really escalating. So with the successful launch of Sputnik by the Soviets, are they spying on us? What do they see? How far can they see? And people really don't know what's going on. But it, it creates this massive fear and motivation in the United States. Because of this fear, Americans really double down on work ethic, competitive edge and really trying to get things done. For example, we create NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration in 1958. We create a government run program specifically um, to focus on this space race. And another thing that is created is the National Defense Education Act, promoting math, sciences, technology education, right? Eventually um, becomes STEM, or today we may use the term STEAM as well. Um, but all of, uh, of this focus on things about, remember, building these missiles or these weapons or having better technology so we can kind of um, beat them out. And the other really interesting thing, a uh, byproduct of the NDEA, is the advanced placement program, putting more high-level classes in these high school settings, creating more rigor. Uh, this is really going to be interesting because this gives birth to the courses um, that you're taking today, these AP courses. So you can thank Sputnik for that one. This is a picture of Sputnik. It, it looks really weird. It's, it's like a globe with four little antennas, but it creates this massive amount of fear until Americans really are going to push 
for this change to actually be um, ahead of the Soviets, and it's going to drive American thinking for the next decade. Now, they may not actually be ahead of us. They beat us to space, but they may not actually be ahead of us in so many other areas. But the fear is that if they did this, what else is next? We're going to put our first American um, in space um, eventually with Alan Shepard, and then we will send um, these men to space. We'll get them into space in the 1950s, and they will come back successfully, which is huge. Um, but eventually, we will put this huge space race to the moon. That'll take place in the Kennedy administration. But um, the big thing that Ike really tries to push for is, is trying to find peace. Um, both sides are testing ridiculously new powerful weapons, hydrogen bombs and ICBMs. Hydrogen bomb is way more powerful than an atomic bomb. To show you the level of scope and power we're talking here, this tiny little circle in the middle here is the wave of um, the atomic bomb, a two mile radius. A hydrogen bomb has a blast radius, an impact radius of over 20 miles. It is so much more devastating. Really, he's gonna push for peace programs and disarmament. Um, one is called Atoms for Peace, which he proposes to the United Nations. And even Khrushchev um, is gonna get involved in this, but. He is going to reject these plans because the Soviet Union is really pushing to get ahead, doesn't want to be even, wants the Soviet Union to get ahead. So it's not going to be as successful for weapon disarmament. So what Eisenhower is really going to, going to warn of in this final term um, is, is at the end of his farewell address, he's going to warn the United States against something that he calls the military industrial complex. And what that is, it's a very intricate system um, of, of intertwining between government contracting, military leaders, and, and, and bureaucrats, politicians, that we are spending so much money that it will completely dominate domestic and foreign policy, that other things will go by the wayside and cause our country to really dissipate and fall apart. And you can see even in some states um, here in 1952 where the value um, of these military contracts based on per person compared to the national average is so much greater where the defense industries in these states are so deeply, deeply tied um, to that, that it's going to make a huge dependency on them that they will eventually will not be able to have a lifeline without it. It will become almost incessant that we're continually building our military and our funding for it. Um, this sort of triangle of death is really going to tie into each other. So for example, um, there's gonna be really big um, military contractors that are gonna be vying for um, this approval or these government jobs that are constant, really good paying and funding. And so they're gonna give a bunch of money to different politicians going into Congress who would then pass these laws. Those congressmen um, that are elected then are going to be passing different forms of tax funding and breaks for the Department of Defense, who is going to then use these tax funded contracts to send out to a very select few large military contractors, sort of creating a monopoly-esque style system. But um, it's really, really going to be this endless cycle where each one feeds the next one. It's going to become this huge problem where there's lobbyists, these defense contractors, and people giving campaign, campaign contributions to um, these people who are trying to influence um, the media outlets and influence the voters who put in the senators and congressmen who then um, are sitting on these armed forces committees that give money back to these defense contractors and one after the other. This whole dependency on um, the military defense industry is going to be one of the biggest reasons why the Soviets um, are, are ultimately going to collapse at the end of the 1940s and early 1990s. But this reliance is something that Ike is really, really scared of. It's the final thing he sort of warns of as his curtain closes, as his administration ends. Now, this is an extremely long video, and I'm fully aware of that. So. Um, I really wanted to close with some final, final conclusions for us here, really to think about it this way. By 1960, so by the end of the 1950s, um, American people were very optimistic about their stance and their role in the world. America is a very strong foreign policy, very greatly respected. Um, we have a huge um, 
kind of a prevalence of power and the standard of living is huge. We're no longer really afraid of this return to a depression. We don't feel like we're in that volatile stage. We feel like we're very, very, very secure. There was Cold War anxiety, whether you're talking about the Red Scare or duck and cover drills, but it's nowhere near as severe as it was at the end of the 40s under Truman. And ultimately, at the end of the day, there were many concerns that are still left. We haven't dived into um, the civil rights movement yet. We're going to give its whole video, or maybe you have to split up into two um, on those issues. But American values of conformity are really, really being brought up and questioned. Um, so it's not so much foreign policy that becomes a big question, but a lot of the domestic stuff that really happened in the 1970s. I hope this helps. I try to make it as in-depth as possible to cover so many different bases. But um, if you have any questions, as always, leave some comments down in the section below. See you.